Um, welcome everybody to this week's Bible Thumping Wingnut show. It's a very special um, show for a bunch of reasons. We've got um, two guests that have been on my show before and two that have never. And um, starting at the far right with the yellow shirt, we have Shane Dotson, who has been on the Bible Thumping Wingnut show before. Shane um, lives, is stationed in Oklahoma, and currently is in Syracuse, New York, um, which is a story in and of itself, is it not? <laughs> yeah. But Shane is Shane's with us here, and he's um, he's he's uh, pertinent to our topic this evening. Uh, Len Pettis, who is uh, Matthew four nineteen on YouTube, is here with me again, and the the man in the middle. I think is he in the middle? Is he in the middle for everybody else? Yeah. Um, welcome everybody to this week's Bible Company Winger show. Somebody's uh, listening to the show and needs to turn it down. That's you, John. Um, <laughs> two guests that have been on my show before and two that have never. You, have to John, you need to uh, you need to mute that. Mute the broadcast. You're right with the yellow shirt. We have Shane Dotson on the show before. I, gotta, I, I should mute him. Okay, he'll he'll figure it out eventually. John, you're looking at the you're looking at the wrong screen. Is <laughs> So anyway, uh, John Speed in the middle is going to figure out how to mute the broadcast. But John is my pastor. Uh, of Christ's King Baptist Church in Syracuse, New York. And, um, I am thrilled to have him with us um, this week. And then our uh, honored guest is uh, Bill Adams. Not that I don't honor all of my guests, but uh, Bill Adams is here, and Bill has a special uh, ministry uh, worldwide, uh, and it's called uh, Sports Fan Outreach. And um, Bill, I, I want to, you know, open it up to you first to share um, what you do. What is sports fan outreach, and how did um, uh, it's a it's this is a real vague thing. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about yourself and about the ministry. Uh, well, Tim, uh, you know, the Lord sort of called me out about 15 or 20 years ago out in the highways of head, just as I say. To essentially do mass evangelism and it turned into open air preaching essentially it started in the um, bar district of Atlanta called Buckhead and then it just went from there and and it went to uh, the business conferences down at the Georgia World Congress Center and the football games the Georgia Dome and that's how the whole thing began to move forward and then the Lord began to show me uh, what was happening at the sporting events I mean I went to almost every home UGA football game for about five or six years. I've been to every Falcons game in the last 13 years, and I've seen the sports thing. And what happens at a sporting event, what I tell everybody, is a couple things. First is the sports marketers, uh, they do the same thing everywhere, whether it's a Georgia game, a Falcons game, the World Cup soccer, the Olympics, the Super Bowl. And what they do is, is they have – working on the art, perfecting the art of putting on basically a huge tailgate party. And that's language for they put on pregame events to draw people out to come to the stadium. Uh, and or they or like the Super Bowl or the Olympics, they do things throughout the time leading up to the particular event. And what they're trying to do for the people is create an experience. And so when someone comes to the Falcons game essentially, they have a thing called Falcons Landing, which is the official pregame party that's right outside the dome. And if the, if the fan comes in as a good time, it really doesn't matter who wins the game. And so if you can if you can inject that reality in the fan's life, then they can keep the fans coming back. And so all of a sudden you move from trying to win games to try to entertain fans, which is where we're at. So you take that concept and then you and then you combine it. This is where the spiritual aspect comes in with the computer and so forth and the sports teams and the leagues are trying to make disciples of the fans. So a guy can go to the Falcons game and then he can come back to the Atlanta Falcons website, follow all the stuff year round, you know, diverge off to ESPN and other things. Before long, that guy's a total disciple 
of the Atlanta Falcons football and NFL. And so you have those th two things working together. And so essentially just keep using the Falcons as an example is that we'll go out and three hours before kickoff and just get out there and uh, this whole principle works wherever I'm at the Olympics or anywhere else. But we get out there early, three or four hours before kickoff. I'll just hang out for a little bit because a lot of people uh, like sports cash and stuff. They walk by this particular place where we work from going to do their job. And I see security and Falcons officials and all kinds of people. And then about two and a half hours before kickoff, two hours, we'll start preaching. And then we'll go to 30 minutes uh, after it kicks off. And what has happened over the years in the Falcons is that um, you almost enter like chaplain-like uh, relationship with people because of the season ticket holder phenomenon. And so people from the Falcons fans, several came to my wedding. They come up and talk to me every week. If you've ever seen this go on, and I, so the ministry goes from open-air preaching to really ministering to the people. Somebody walked up that I knew one day and said his cousin, his nephew was with him. The nephew's father had killed himself the night before to pray for him. And so, you know, all kinds of things go on out there. It's just way more. The preaching is, is the main emphasis for me to be out there to do it. But the ministry that, that works around there is, um, is also happening as well. So all of a sudden you see that a, that a football game especially uh, is, creates this opportunity to minister and evangelize. And that's really – how the sports, why sports. Does that make sense? Is that a clear statement? Yeah. Um, so you're 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 getting you're doing street preaching at sporting events. Now, do you do you just do uh, the football games or um, what other events do you you reach no, out? No, uh, well, when we uh, what we try to do in the United States, even around the world, is target the industry event. So in other words, we like we do the Final Four basketball. I mean, there's a lot of big basketball games, but if you go to the Final Four, um, then you've got a multiple day event, and you also have almost every. Then you also have a diversity of crowd that comes. You have a lot of fans, and they do the pregame stuff of these. Uh, what's it called? The Big Dance. The NCAA puts on this thing called the Big Dance, which draws people out all weekend. But also, almost every Division One coach comes to the host city, and they have meetings during that weekend. So you have a diversity of people that are there. You've got former players. And so that's why you target what I call the industry event. And so you go to the Final Four. Uh, you go to the NBA and baseball all-star weekends because the same phenomenon is going on. It's when they highlight themselves. And essentially that's what the Super Bowl is. Is when the, What's happened to the Super Bowl weekend is that the league is, put, is uh, putting its product on display, which is a game. And the days leading up to Sunday night are the league, all the people that support the NFL come to that host city, owners, corporate sponsors, politicians, the whole crowd uh, comes to that host city and they throw their parties and have their meetings. And then Sunday night is just icing on the cake. So you see that. So that's what I mean by an industry event. Uh, we also do World Cup, which is soccer, which is the biggest sport on the planet. Uh, which is in Brazil this year. I've done two of those, South Africa and Berlin, uh, the Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics. So you see, uh, we're not just going to the big soccer match between Argentina and Mexico. We're going down to the industry event because of these dynamics that are at work. And um, you also enter, because the um, events like the World Cup is a month long, uh, the Olympics is two weeks, you get the multiple days in, and just the more time you can spend with the crowd, the more you can penetrate, the more ministry happens, and and that's why we sort of target what I call the industry events. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you get many opportunities because the you know very large crowd for multiple days. Yes. So it's a great opportunity to get the gospel out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of my best stories, uh, and I'll move, uh, is that I used to go to the Masters Golf Tournament. Uh, I went about seven or eight years, and um, anyway, I, I, when I'm out preaching, I wear a cowboy hat for various reasons, but one reason I wear it is so that people can remember me, and so um, because you're just trying to help people remind them who you are and what you're doing and all this kind of good stuff. Anyway, so we go over to the uh, Rugby World Cup, uh, my wife and I, in 2007, which is in Paris, and we're walking out to the Champs-Élysées to start 
preaching in French and passing out French tracts. It was quite a sight. But this guy looks over at me, and he recognizes me, and he points at me, goes to the masters, and he recognized my hat, and then he came over and talked to me, and we talked for five minutes, and he was a stockbroker of sorts in London. And so the point is is that uh, sports, uh, if you sort of enter the whole world understanding the repetitive nature of the fan, and that a lot of people that go to high-profile events go to more than one high-profile event, and you just get in the mindset of that, then a lot of doors are opening that you're not necessarily seeing open. And so it, it's it's an it's an unusual it's an unusual sort of um, worldwide format. Until they change the rules, I guess we'll keep going, which I guess they could. But uh, anyway. So one of is is the Super Bowl the biggest that you do yearly, or is there another one that's bigger? Uh, in terms of getting people to go, it's by far the biggest. Uh, the Super Bowl, uh, obviously I'm speaking of uh, the, the cultural dynamics, if you will, but I think the Super Bowl is the biggest event on the planet that gets watched. They have a huge audience just on the game. And what that means is that the Super Bowl, people pay attention to the Super Bowl that don't even like football. And so what, you, so what happens uh, there's a couple things. First of all, people get excited about going to the Super Bowl and being in the city, and for the for the preacher being there in the middle of all that is an exciting uh, place to be. Uh, it's just so much more than a uh, a big football game in Atlanta. It's just it's just uh, if you've never been in the city, the whole city rolls out the red carpet. You get this feel in the city that it's just no other place to be on the world, but right here in New York City. For Super Bowl weekend, and I personally enjoy being there. It's my favorite event. But anyway, it attracts people, and they want to be there. The other thing that happens, so let's say, you know, I'm in Atlanta, and I start telling people I'm going to the Super Bowl. Well, immediately people begin to pay attention, and and what are you going to do the Super Bowl? I'm going up there to talk about Jesus, and that opens doors even back home. So the ministry part begins as soon as someone commits to going. They can. Because people's response to the Super Bowl, they can immediately begin to minister in their own world, and way before they get to New York City in this case. And then they come home, and their friends and their church wants to know what happened at the Super Bowl. And most of that's really because of the Super Bowl. The interest just sort of buff, buffers, buffers uh, people's interest in what you're doing. And so it all works together uh, to create what has become the Super Bowl outreach. And so, really, when I, we got into it, um, uh, I'd gotten to know John and Marv and Tim and some guys a little bit, and I was thinking this was back before Tampa about five or six years ago, and just began to understand that really in the life of an evangelist, what really lays the foundation so that they will continue. If there's one thing that you can do in the human realm, and that is to provide a, a multiple-day event that includes teaching and fellowship and actual ministry, which is exactly what GNN was doing, the Ambassadors Alliance was doing, and so, in essence, we've just copied the model that they that they all knew, and so that's why the Super Bowl outreach involves uh, fellowship as a very key component, because we're, most of us don't have the opportunity to fellowship with like-minded people. So, to be in a room with a hundred guys like yourself, that's just like drinking. That's just a breath of fresh air. And then each year, we we bring in teaching. The teaching uh, the the theme changes sort of based on things going on in our community and sort of what the Lord is saying, and but the teaching also brings, it's just like going to church, you know, you end up with a group of people who've heard the same message, and that facilitates conversation, it helps us grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord together, and so out of all of the fellowship and the teaching, we go out to minister in this very electric environment, and so it all works together to create what can be a very life-changing experience for the evangelist that goes. So, your Super Bowl outreach um, this year, it's going to be in New York City. Right. And from speaking to you and from speaking to others who have gone, I, I've never been, um, but a bunch of men from all over the country go to where the, the Super Bowl is. And um, what they, they, they go there, I know I heard that they leave basically when the Super Bowl begins. Right. But they, when do they get there and what is... What, can they expect during the week? Um, 
you know, they get ministered to, they have fellowship one with another, but logistically speaking, when do they come in, and, and what's that look like? Uh, it's a good question. Well, last year, and we're going to do it again this year, I'm pretty sure, is we're going to start on Thursday, which is January the 30th, and start about uh, 10 in the morning. I got, I'm not exactly, I uh, just got to uh, submit that in the schedule, but so we're going to start early Thursday morning. We're going to do a couple things this year that we haven't done before. Uh, last year, we had several guys preach about just various aspects of the preacher's life. And this year, we're going to, I think we're going to talk about preaching. We're going to, I think we're going to teach homiletics early from 10 to 2, 10 to 3 for guys that are preachers that want to be preachers. I think we're going to offer some other training uh, for people who don't want to preach but want to learn other skills. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to unfold. So we'll do that between 10 and 3, 10 and 4. And then uh, 5 o'clock, we'll have a dinner. And then this is what we normally we normally have started at 5 o'clock with a dinner and a speaker, and then we get rolling into the whole weekend. And so we start early in the morning, 10 o'clock on Thursday. We'll go to about 8 or 9 o'clock Thursday night. We'll get up at 7 on Friday and Saturday and pray for an hour, eat breakfast, and then have a two-hour time of teaching, and then be moving towards a ministry site this year by 11.30 and be out till probably 9 or 9.30 at night because we're in New York City. We can Stay out a little bit longer Sunday. I'm not sure when the kickoff is, but I imagine it will be about 8 o'clock, 7 or 8. So we'll probably ordinarily start an hour early. So we'll pray at 6, breakfast at 7, two hours of teaching, and then get out by 10.30. Uh, and that's how it will work. Uh, wow, wow. And if, if, if people want to um, be involved with this, how do they how do they – Get in contact with you about information. What's the best way? Well, Tim, there's two sites. One is the Super Bowl site itself. It's uh, SuperBowlOutreach.org, and the information's all there, including a place to register. Uh, if you want to uh, go to the sports fan site, it's SFOI.org. You can go there and see what's going on and just uh, communicate with me through one of the sites. But that's the best thing to do. The Super Bowl outreach site has all the information. And if you go to the sports fan site, it'll send you to the Super Bowl site. And uh, I do want to say this. Our theme this year, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, some of this is uh, personal in a sense, but we're going to talk about Jesus. Uh, we really want to uh, focus on who he is. So. The catchphrase is Jesus prophesied, Jesus incarnated, and Jesus fulfilled. And as best we can in four days, we want to learn as much about him as possible. Uh, the real motivation here is to um, really grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, really get to know him and put all the pieces together from prophecy, Genesis 3.15, to what he fulfilled in the feast, and really get a clear handle on on who he is, on his life when he was on the earth. I think this is important. You know, I've studied a lot of doctrine and theology over the years. Uh, so uh, come in and he, he is coming and really focus on him, I believe, is the next step. And one reason is because he's, he was the one that was on the cross, as obvious as that is, as our substitutionary atonement toner. Uh, you know, we can't help but know more about him. But in a ministry sense, obviously we all know this, the devil has done a great job at bringing confusion about who he is. And if there's one issue that we need to set forth, I believe, is we need to set forth Jesus and put him out there and let people deal with him. And we need to know who he is, and they need to know who he is. And I believe we need to preach a lot about him and because there's such confusion. And I think a lot of our debates or come from a lack of knowledge of who he is and what he did on the cross and these kind of things. And not that that'll settle or stop the debates, but I think going forward, we really need to be very clear on who he is and what he did and what his life was like. So we have an unwavering faith in, in him. And because I believe that's going to be the great challenge uh, in the days ahead. So we're going to have speakers talk about that. Well, let me say uh, for people who may uh, have just tuned in uh, recently, uh, a special guest 
this week is Bill Adams. He's with Sports Fan Outreach, and uh, specifically the outreach that we're discussing today is the uh, outreach in New York City for the Super Bowl. Uh, the, and the outreach begins at the end of January, and it goes through the beginning of February. And uh, he's talking about how um, at this event, preachers and evangelists come to New York City, and they are not only out doing street evangelism, they are getting ministered to um, as they sit down and, and be taught and, and preached, have the advantage of uh, hearing preachers preach uh, to edify them, to, to grow their knowledge and, and strengthen them and, and their uh, understanding of the scriptures. Bill, as you, as you consider um, the folks who come, what kind of candidates are you looking for? What kind of uh, folks are you looking for to recruit to bring to this event? Well, good question. I think what has happened in the past is we've guys who have a lot of experience, who are at it a lot, or full time at it, these kind of things, who've in their own life made a commitment. Uh, that's one group of people, and the other group would be those who've never done it before. Um, and it, that's what I'm really looking for. That's kind of what, in the sense of. Uh, we would like for the event to be something where first timers can come and join in and feel comfortable doing it. Uh, partly because of the nature of the event, the Super Bowl, partly to be around other men who've had a lot of experience. Uh, that's part of the training, the teaching, the way it's sort of organized, but the teaching is informal by being around guys and having a chance to talk. And so both of those kind of groups I'm looking for. Um, that's just it. So really, if you have no experience but want to do it, um, you know, you're welcome. Uh, that's for sure. I hope, hopefully that's clear. Well, um, I wanted to that, – that is good. That's clear. Um, I wanted to ask the other guys to share some of their experiences, um, what they have – uh, John, how many times have you been to this Super Bowl outreach? Um, I'm going to ask John, Len, and uh, Shane to share a little bit about your interaction in going to this event. John? Um, I was just sitting here thinking about that. I think it's been five times. Yeah, something like that. I think. And it's been a phenomenal experience. Every time that I've gone, I've gone to lead teams, and everybody that I've taken has are people that I know or um, people that are friends of people that I know, and just a great bonding experience. We've had some great times in the teaching times before with the emphasis that we've had at, at different events, and uh, it's just amazing to me. It's just stunning how many people come out to those events and how many opportunities you have to proclaim the gospel. I think it's a great way to train new people in how to share the gospel because you just have so many opportunities to do it. It's it's a rare opportunity to get you know new people together with some people who are experienced and get the hands-on training that they might not be able to get otherwise. Yeah, I would let me inject in there. Obviously, I'm a little biased since we sort of host it, but, you know, if you're out preaching and witnessing for eight or nine hours a day, three days in a row, uh, you that's ample opportunity to get out and get the experience or grow. I say all the time to the team leaders, you know, this is the time for us to grow, for your team to grow. This is not this is not a an apathetic, lukewarm environment we're trying to create here. We're trying to push everybody to grow, whether that's in their prayer life or they're preaching. We want people to try new things. The other thing I would say for someone who is say, you know, look, I can go down here to whatever place and evangelize on my own or with my buddy. That's true. But I, if you've never been to a big event uh, like this, it is. I just say it's just beyond being. It's beyond worth it to get in an environment with guys that know what they're doing. To get in the environment of a Super Bowl and be out preaching for eight or nine hours. That in and of itself. It's something that will push you when most people don't get out that long. But you're doing that for three hours, for three days in a row. And oftentimes by Sunday night, it's kind of like fasting. In a sense, by the last day, at the last moment, you just it's over and you're exhausted, which is what we want. 
and you just are like floored at all that you were able to do in that time. So it's hard to judge if you've never been. Uh, you're probably not a good judge to say, well, it's not really worth it. I'm saying, I think John would attest to it and Lynn, that it's definitely worth it, the quote hassle, and to pay for it and get there and get off work and all that is, I don't have any qualms saying that. I think it's definitely worth it for anybody. Because when, then when you go back, your ministry, wherever you're at at home, is exponentially more fruitful because of this experience you've had. Shane Dodson. I'm going to skip uh, Len. Shane, can you hear me? Okay. We'll go right to Len. I was, I was going to ask Shane. Skip. Len, you've gone. How many times have you gone, and, and what, what's been your impressions of Super Bowl outreach? I am uh, I, I am a one-time veteran. I was there last year in New Orleans. Um, and my experience, you know, as I was recruiting my team and trying to think of how do I describe, you know, how do I describe what this is to really make it clear to people just how big of a deal this is um, and what it's going to mean to your ministry personally, what it's going to mean to you as an individual. And the only word I could come up with was apostolic. You know, it's like Bill was saying that you have so many like-minded people when in your community and in your church, um, maybe you're lucky to get four or five people out with you to do a, a, any kind of regular evangelism. You know, to see 120 people walking down a bus stop, a, a line stretching two blocks, and they're all carrying signs and crosses and banners, and it's like, man, the Lord is raising up an army. You know, and they are all c concentrated in this one place. But, you know, and I say it's like, you know, the, the, the reason I came up with the word apostolic is I just, the, the, the picture I have in my mind of what fellowship must have been like between Peter and John or like Paul and Barnabas and Apollos and everything. And, you know, when, when, when Peter and John were brought before the, the council and told they need to stop preaching, <laughs> and they said, hey, do what you got to do. We're going to keep preaching. We can't help but speak of that which we've seen and heard. And they were scourged and put out of the synagogue. And the, the scripture says that they rejoiced that they were able to share in the suffering uh, of Christ. And, um, you know, that's really what it is. I mean, I, I, I told all these guys, like, you're not going to come back from this event rested. It is going to push you. It's going to... Uh, it's going to push you emotionally, it's going to push you physically, it's going to push you in, in every way spiritually possible. Um, you know, I don't know, man, it was just amazing to walk into a room and see a bunch of brothers praying together and confessing and, and weeping and, and talking about the things that they've experienced on the streets. Like, it was just powerful. Like, apostolic is, is the strongest word that I can come up with to describe it, and I, I don't think I'm exaggerating to just say that that description might fall short also. It's just awesome. It's awesome. Hey, Tim, I'll tell a quick story. Thinking about um, Lynn's example of everybody walking down to the uh, bus stop, which happened last year in New Orleans. So we pray a lot. You know, we pray every week. Once you once you register and all that, we, we have a weekly uh, prayer call leading up to the I've been itself first because, you know, prayer is a, a must for all that can happen and go on. We must pray for it. And then second, it, bring, it brings about uh, fellowship and, commun and uh, community with one another before we get to the, in this case, New York City. But anyway, but one thing we pray for is that uh, everybody in the city will hear the gospel, will know that, you know, the, know the name of Jesus and those kind of things. Well, uh, one of last year's team leaders, Rick Skeens from Phoenix, got into a cab in downtown New Orleans and the cab driver said, who are you? You know, what are you doing here? And he explained. And the cab driver says, well, you are the guys that everybody that, that is getting into my cab is talking about. And so we had 10 teams of 10 spread throughout downtown New Orleans, which is not a very large geographical place. And, and the whole area had been saturated with the gospel. And so, so just imagine that and everybody being together and everybody that's, that's there hearing the word begins to identify and see what's happening, that you have this mass of people uh, talking about Jesus and believing in him. And it, spiritually speaking, and we obviously we don't know the 
the outcome of that, but the implications are tremendous. And so the world sees it and hears it. It's, so we're not just anonymous strangers rolling into a big city and no one knows we're there or they think we're, no man, they hear it. They definitely hear it. And uh, there's no quite, even, even in Phoenix in uh, Dallas, which was such a big area and we were working two areas. I mean, they, they, the same thing. People know you're there. They see the continuity and I'm sure having been around this whole thing this long that, uh, the people at the NFL know we're there. There's no question the security people understand. And so we're definitely not an anonymous group. The whole the whole world, if you will, that we're in the middle of is definitely hearing the gospel. That's exciting. I mean, I'm, that doesn't happen every day for me in downtown Atlanta. Now, um, street preaching for many Christians is something that is – John Speed, this question is going to be for you. So um, I'm going to direct it towards you. Your camera's not working, so I all I see is a picture of you kind of looking down. Um, huh. But anyway, John, um, a lot of a lot of people have don't feel comfortable with street preaching. Um, they don't; they're not involved in it. And when they see it, they wonder um, if it's a good idea or not. It, is it any use? Is it for today? And I and I wanted you to speak to that. Um, for somebody who might be watching, who who is a believer, who says, you know, my pastor doesn't do that, and you, it just seems a little over the top, a little, a little, kind of too aggressive. What what would you say about that? Well, street preaching is uh, one of the most biblical things that you can do in terms of evangelism. You have all the examples from the New Testament of Jesus himself and the apostles uh, going out to preach the gospel. Uh, you also have throughout church history, street preaching is a huge element in evangelism and outreach all through the last 2,000 years of church history. So to say that it's irrelevant would be to throw something out that has been as um, much a part of Christianity as the Bible <laughs> in a lot of respects. So, in terms of methodology, anyways, and um, you know, as far as fruitfulness is concerned, uh, we anyone who's been doing this for any length of time has story after story of ways the Lord has used street preaching to uh, reach the lost, as well as uh, to grow us individually in our walk with Christ. Um, so. You know, it, it's actually at a point now where if I run into people who say, well, I don't, I don't believe in street preaching, I really have a hard time taking them very seriously uh, because I've, I've been doing this for not a long time, but for about nine years. And in that time, uh, I've seen so much fruit from it that to even try to defend it is kind of ridiculous. Um, I don't really feel like I need to defend things that the Lord has done so clearly uh, over th that I've seen over that time. Uh, speaking of, of the effectiveness, um, there in my promotional video for this Bible Thumping Ringnut show, I um, put the uh, last call video, and um, that's a video that you know a lot of people are posting, a lot of evangelists are posting on. Facebook and and all around it's getting a lot of hits and I mirrored it on my channel as a, a promotion for tonight's uh, show I wanted to ask Len to kind of explain what what's in that video uh, and kind of promote it and, and tell folks they should go watch it oh that last call video yeah that's amazing um, I don't know how many in the room have seen it but basically it's a it's a video of Robert Gray preaching at a bus stop. Um, Robert Gray, if anyone knows, he's with Cross Country Evangelism. Him and Mike Stockwell travel together. I think pretty much everyone in this room knows those two men. But um, they're preaching at a, a, a bus stop that's very busy, and most people are indifferent. And there's a man on Robert's team who is standing holding an Are You Ready cross, and there's a man standing next to him who you can tell is listening and coming under conviction. And it talks about, you know, there's like a graphic that says, you know, they're at this busy bus stop. Most people are indifferent to the preaching of the gospel except this one guy. 
And uh, so it, it goes, you know, it, it starts talking about him and how things radically changed in his life. Over the next three weeks, his life radically changed because he died. And then it goes to his funeral. There's footage of his funeral, and the pastor preaching at his funeral is talking about this video of the street preacher named Robert Gray who's compassionately preaching the gospel. And if anyone's seen Robert preach, I mean, that's the best way to describe his preaching. He preaches with, with great compassion, great love for the lost, a great love for the Lord and bringing him glory. And um, so it... it, it it shows the pastor kind of describing what's happening in the video, and then it toggles back to the actual footage of, of Robert preaching. Um, and at one point, you know, Robert is, at, Robert is saying there's someone at this bus stop who's going to die. It may not be today. It may not be this week. But someone in this crowd is going to die soon, you know. Um, and... Uh, he just goes on talking about the need for repentance. And he says, will someone here repent? Will someone here turn their life over to Christ and be made a new creature? And this man standing next to um, the Are You Ready cross, you hear him in the background, I will. And Robert Gray points to him and he, you know, is encouraging him and continues preaching and everything. And it's just an amazing, amazing testimony of what the power of street preaching is. And um, I know in my experience, um, in the two and a half, almost three years that I've been open air preaching now, it seems like there's always, you know, uh, there is always a lot of indifference, but, the, but it seems like there's always that one person who you get done and there's just that one really meaningful conversation that you have, or you'll even see somebody get saved like that. But, um, you know, the truth is, if no one were to listen, and if nobody ever got saved, God is glorified at the preaching of his gospel. But that video, that last call video, which everyone should go and see, I think it's got like 12,000 hits, which is pretty unusual for an open-air preaching video. They don't get a lot of view counts on, uh, um, on YouTube, but to have 12,000 hits in two or three days is amazing, and it's because it really demonstrates the power of open-air preaching. When it's done biblically, when it's done correctly, when it's done with compassion, um, you know, uh, I think it's a great testimony to um, the open-air preaching community. And I think the reason that a lot of people um, fear open-air preaching or they look down on it is because it's the, the guys who are doing it poorly who get all the attention, the Pelagians, the semi-Pelagians, the Westboro Baptists, and things like that, that um, are out there preaching a false gospel or preaching no gospel. They're just preaching straight law and, you know, the need for holiness, but without letting people know what the source of our holiness is. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that last call video is a vi uh, one that everyone needs to go and see. It's amazing. Yeah, I've watched it three times, and I, I literally cried each time. Um, very, very powerful. Shane Dotson is back. Shane, I wanted to ask you to share your experience. I actually am assuming that you've been to the Super Bowl outreach with Sports Fan Outreach. No, actually. Oh, you haven't? <laughs> no, sorry. Do you plan on going this year? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trip to Syracuse is uh, uh, take its toll on us financially, so yeah, probably not gonna be able to make it to the Super Bowl. It will be close, close to here though. I, I'm gonna now boot you out of this hangout. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm an out, I'm an outcast. Now Jim, you're you're involved in. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Jim, can I share something about the preaching question? Yes. If I do that, you know, first of all, I think um, it's it's a little more uh, demands a little more than this. But you say when someone asks you about the effectiveness of it, you know, it's like let's step back and say, where's the joy of the Lord, and why should I keep my mouth shut about the great news of our salvation? And so, the, to me, the question is a methodological methodol logical question it's not based on on the on the basis of being saved or what Jesus did or anything and so I I find the question to be just dismiss the question 
and the, it takes us down a rabbit trail. We're, we're debating method and not, we're not talking about how does the good news of Jesus get spread. And I think we, we, get, we get shut down on that. So first of all, I say we all should be led by the joy of the Lord, if you will, for we've been saved and now we're reconciled with God. And that's, that's worth just standing out on the, on the street corner and shouting about to some degree. The other part of it is that preaching, by the foolishness of preaching, I know you can say the preaching, the message, but the authority of the kingdom of God in part is in preaching. I've seen it. I've seen amazing things happen when I didn't even know what I was doing, but just standing out at Piedmont Park, down in Gay Pride, reading the Bible or preaching something. And preaching is where the authority is. And one reason the church is so uh, anemic is there's no preaching. And when you read preachers and you begin to understand that evangelical preaching, which is repentance and faith preaching, Christ-centered preaching, is that's when the great advancements in the kingdom are made. They're not made through liturgy. They're not made on, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations. They're made through preaching. And if we don't start preaching, we're going to get run over like a, like a roller. And I think the Lord has raised up open-air preachers across this country as a sign of his authority to this nation that that he is still here and they can just say he's dead all they want to. But the authority is vested in the preaching. And God calls men to preach and he sends us out there with that authority and things happen in his authority through preaching, which don't happen when you're just talking to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, to me, the question is based on tremendous ignorance. And I, I mean, I'm not saying you know, making fun of the person. It's just a totally ignorant question. And I find it, you know, we shouldn't even really answer it. We should just really answer the question in the way the scripture teaches us to answer and not get bogged down in all these systematic methodological discussions with people. I'm sorry, John. I want to ask you, um, Bill, you've been involved in street preaching for many, many years. Um, and it's been, I have not, and it just seems to me that there's a lot of them out there now, and uh, oh yeah, did there? I assume it's been growing because I, I didn't notice it before. Um, what do you attribute um, the growth to? Well, look, I'm a, I've been at it long enough. In the '90s, it started for me, and that was in a in a very uh, informal way. But I've I've been I've been at it. That would be 18 years that I've been out going places. Time in, in November 2000. So when I started in November 2000, uh, it was just in Atlanta. It was just me and, and one other person. And when I went places, it was uh, it was uh, other people that wouldn't agree with our uh, theology, and that was it. And so now I've seen it go from zero to a hundred guys at the Super Bowl, a hundred at the Herald Society. The Lord is raising up men. He's doing it and sending us out to preach his gospel. Because you can't, I don't believe, I don't believe that a man just wakes up one day and says, I want to go out there and open air preach. I've never, you know, the guys that come out and stick with it, that's a, that's, a, that's a calling. That's a whole other topic in a sense, but the Lord's doing this. And so don't, don't, uh, hopefully no one ascribes, uh, free will and just uh, things to this kind of nature because of the intensity of it, uh, because of the depravity of our sin in us. We just cannot go out and withstand all the challenges that we have to just on our own strength and accord. There's definitely a divine work here. So you, if we had to, I think we could, what, probably, John, get two or 300 guys together. I mean, if we, maybe more, I don't know. I mean, John was there with the, GNN, Tony with the Masters Alliance, and they all know thousands of people, but guys that are really out preaching, I'd say at least a good couple hundred guys could do it, don't you think? And that's the Lord's work. And if we, I think where we're at now is that, you know what, uh, Jeff Rose and those guys are doing the Herald Society, what we're trying to do with the preaching, we're trying this, I think the Lord's trying to mature us to give us stability so we can, you know, stay in this thing for the long haul and also be there to help the next guy come along, which is obviously our obligation as well. So I've seen it with zero, me and one of the guy that wasn't a preacher, and we're here today. That's the work of the Lord, and so I'm fully, I think that God has demonstrated his faithfulness to us, and if we remain faithful, I don't think there's, we can't imagine what can happen if we'll just keep at it. What do you think, John? 
Yeah, I mean, if you think about what was happening when Way of the Master was first becoming popular back, you know, in 2004, 2005, uh, the very first boot camp that they did, there were like 35 people there, maybe 40, and we kind of felt like we were the it, you know, like we were the 40 people that had really been impacted enough by way of the master to go out there on the streets and hit the streets on a regular basis, and now we've gone from that in 2004 to a place where there have been thousands of people trained, and um, there are hundreds of regular street preachers that go out every week across the country and in a lot of other nations. So it's stunning what God has done. And over the last few years, we've seen a, kind of the theme of maturity in ministry be uh, not harped on, but it's been a repetitive thing over the last few years. And the whole thing's maturing to a degree that I think even some of the bigger name uh, evangelical speakers, you know, pastors and things like that are even taking notice of it now. And uh, God's doing a work. Um, it's It'll be real interesting to see where it goes in the next five or ten years. You know, I've, I've read a little bit about the 18th century, Wesley and Whitfield and all that, and there was about 60 core people involved in that. Some were pastors, some were lay people, some were you know, Wesley and their friends. So once you begin to see how this thing develops, you have a core group of people who are very faithful, even, you know, faithful to the gospel, faithful to each other. And once that starts happening, that that's a sign to me from God right there. He's working and something is happening. And I've heard it said before that what kept, uh, you know, England from going the way of France and their humanist revolution was the preachers. And so... To me, what is happening is I'm not, you know, the United States is going to do what it's going to do for God's will, but he is raising us up to, to for something to happen here, perhaps similar to that time in England. We don't know, but you can't look askance at this and belittle what's happening. I think this is a very significant uh, work God is doing. I think it's a very significant uh, work he's given us to do. And in that light, it's a serious thing for all of us who are committed to it. But, you know, the we have no idea where it's going. And I think it could, you know, it could explode at any moment. I really believe at any moment, a thing like Robert Gray is a kind of a sign, if you will. I think I think we, we're such sinners that we have to spend a lot of time getting sanctified. And so let's say this, that 50 people all of a sudden turn and say, what must I do to be saved? Well, if you're not sanctified, you know, obviously that'll go to your head and you'll take credit and all those kind of things. But so we had to really get sanctified so that doesn't happen. And I think we're getting there. And I think I think once we the Lord says See, these guys are ready, I think things are gonna happen. And not because it makes us justifies us, but to me that is the is what that's what he does. He, that's his business, if you will. The redemption of his people. And he's setting us out to for that very purpose. I mean we just don't know one day we could wake up and go on Facebook and Legitimately, 50, 100 people get saved, and probably from people we wouldn't expect. And, you know, it could just really explode if we just remain faithful in preaching and faithful in our prayers and don't get caught up in all this distracting stuff. I, I just think it could be like the 18th century. And then, yeah, you see the other thing. We went over to London this summer, and just in the way that sort of worked these things out, looking for other guys over there preaching, there was a guy over there who had started a, open air preaching training thing in London and through that website there were some guys in Madrid, Spain that was called on the red box but they were doing the same thing hey you know the, the Lord's definitely working and he's working through open air preaching without a doubt I have a question for you guys who've been you know uh, walking with the Lord a lot longer and doing uh, open air ministry a lot longer than I have. We, we, we talk about the effect that open-air preaching is having on the streets. What effect is it having on the church? Do you think it's affecting um, the way leaders within the church um, are doing ministry inside the doors of the church? You know what I mean? Like, do you think it's, it's having an effect um, on the way that um, pastors are preaching from the pulpit at all? Does that make sense? 
Well, I do think there are guys the Lord's calling to, that's why I'm big rush to expository preaching. The, the, the preaching thing is, is we're part of it, and he's working in the pulpit to get these guys to do the same thing. And so I believe that um, we're not necessarily causing that, but I think the Lord's causing them to do it. So there's a, there's a re resurgence of expository biblical preaching, and uh, you see it everywhere. So in that sense, uh, the Lord's making that happen. I do think, you know, if we stay faithful again, I think, you know, just the con, again, we're, we're, we've got such a foe here. We've, you know, my great misunderstanding is, is uh, how dead and sin men are and just the, the, the power of the devil and the kingdom of darkness. And we're fighting a great foe. And it takes this uh, just jackhammer drive to break through. And so that all of a sudden, what you're asking, Lynn, really begins to happen in numbers. The people going, five people going to one pastor and saying, I see these guys all the time. And obviously they will go to their pastor, you know, led by the Lord and not by something we've done. But so again, for that to really happen in mass and really begin to move people in our direction requires on our part tremendous consistency. But, but since you see the Lord working in the pulpit and raise resurgence of expository preaching, I believe that would be his intent is for what we're doing to work in concert with them, to be an encouragement with them and rebuke other pastors who re reject it. It's just a lot. Uh, so I do see that through us things are going to happen and more can happen if we remain faithful. I mean, you see the look in people's face, don't you? They look at you, they don't come up and talk to you like, wow, this is amazing. And then you see Christians who've never seen it before. They go, praise the Lord. And I think one thing, one ministry we have is to the believer and they never see anybody stand up for their faith because the media doesn't show it, and the right. guy probably did not do it. And all of a sudden, here's some guys that are standing up for Jesus, and they go, wow, this is an amazing sight. And uh, so, yeah, man, I agree. I think, in a sense, it's starting to happen like like salvations, yeah. I've, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've been out um, just a handful of times with John in Syracuse, and one of the most encouraging things is when those believers come up to you who who know the gospel and and they their eyes are real big they're you can tell they've never seen it before and they just like who are you guys what are you what are you saying and then and they're all they're the, you know you you find out that you're, you're talking to a brother in Christ and they're they're so excited about it and they're like wow this is amazing and then you just engage them and they're like man i i need to share Christ more I mean, you guys are a great example. God bless you. And, and they'll even come and pray with you, you know? And uh, it's just a great, a, great, uh, a great encouragement when they do that. Yeah, I think that's another tactic of the devil that, you know, discourage everybody, make you lukewarm, believe no one else is really believing and standing up. And before long, you know, you just go cold. I mean, we, we just have to stand out there in the... Stand out in the open for the sake of the believer is the sake of the unbeliever, in a sense of the lost man. Yeah, man, well, that's just not, it's very discouraging to be a Christian in the United States in the Western world. I've been all over the Western world. It's all the same. All the issues are the same. Uh, and, the, and the media and all this is just beating you down left and right. It's a hopeless, hopeless environment. So we provide a lot of people a visible sign of God's hope to inspire them to move on. You have to remember that, I believe, so that you can, be an encouragement to people that really believe and have been, because obviously the Lord brought them to you so they can see you and you can be an encouragement to them. Amen. Well, That's I amazing. have decided to um, go to the outreach at Super Bowl. Uh, Len, asked, Len asked me. I didn't register yet, but I will very okay. soon. Uh, Len has, you asked Len to uh, put a team together. Right. And he asked me, so I'm I'm nervous about it. I'm excited about it. Um, it's my understanding that John is going to also be a part of that team, so it would be great to have my pastor there. Um, I don't know what it is about um, street preaching, but the few times that I felt real comfortable up there, it was right after John preached. Um, I don't know something about his demeanor when he's up there. Uh, I, I think uh, he's real comfortable up there. and. Um, I like to follow him, so maybe I'll get to follow him in, <laughs> in New York City. Um, interesting part about the Internet is I, I met John on the Internet. I also met Len on the Internet. 
and um, Len's a street preacher in Wisconsin, and uh, in talking to him, uh, he says that when Christians come up to him and they have a, an issue with uh, the street preacher, um, Len has something that he does when a Christian uh, comes. Len, what do you do? What do you do when a preacher uh, or a Christian says, hey, you shouldn't be doing that? I hand them John Speed's book. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. I, I, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I used to argue with Christians, like, well, then how would you do it, and this and that. And I'm like, hey, I got this book. I carry like 10 of them in my backpack, the evangelism in the New Testament. Just read this and, and pray for me. You know, because otherwise you get, you know, what's the testimony of two Christians arguing methodology on the street? You know, it's it's not good. So honestly, that's how I handle it now. <laughs> so, and by the way, the name of that book by John Speed is Evangelism in the New Testament, available at www.1milliontracks.com. So plug that for you, John. That's good. <laughs> Make sure you get some royalties from that. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, it's a great book, though. It is. Um uh, I gave it to my pastor, and he loved it. I said, "Hey, check this out. What do you tell me? What you think of it?" And he really, he really appreciated it. Thought it was spot on. There was a guy who got that book uh, shortly after it was published. He was an assistant pastor in a seeker-sensitive church, mm. and he read the book and got fired up about it. Took it to the senior pastor and promptly got fired. <laughs> really? No way! Really? <laughs> wow! Some of the first fruit from that book. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I'm glad you had a good experience anyway, and you still have your job. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, I don't work for my church, so I'm yeah. fortunate in that regard. But right. Um, <laughs> but um, it is, it is something, especially for anyone who does campus preaching. Um, it's very frustrating when you go on to campus to preach and your greatest opposition comes from Campus Crusade for Christ or Inner Varsity or, um, gosh, what is the other one? What is the other? Um, I can't think of it. Yeah, Navigators. It's frustrating when, when your greatest opposition comes from those who claim the name of Christ. and But the opportunity there is that, you know, uh, well, it's like Ray Comfort says, when someone tells you I'm a Christian, that's code for saying, you know, hey, witness to me, you know, <laughs> because what you learn about these people is that they, they said a sinner's prayer, they came up in a youth group where they were licking peanut butter out of their youth pastor's armpits and stuff like that, and, you know, sadly, most of these college ministries are nothing more than an extension of the youth group culture. Um, and it's run by people who came out of youth group who are now 25 or 26 years old. And um, and sadly, I think that that's what's also given birth to our mega church movement, the seeker sensitive church movement. Is you know the I, you know I know youth youth group is a 20th century construct and everything. It's not biblical. But then uh, you know you that grows into a college ministry that looks very similar. Um, and then that. Those people go off to seminary, and you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm way off on that, but that's and that's off topic. Besides, so I should maybe just stop talking. Well, it's back to the topic of you know the why open air preach, and you know you, you immediately stir people up when you start doing it, and they immediately come out and say, hey, that ain't the right way to do it. And so you've 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 entered the spiritual authority zone with these people. And, you know, you just never know what they're, I don't know, man. This thing is so watered down. It's just so watered down. The, the message is watered down. The church has watered it down. And I think we just need to quit apologizing for it and say, hey, we're doing it. Just go talk to somebody else because we're going to be preaching because the Lord right. calls to preach. And, you know, I can't help it because you got that deal with the, in the youth group, you know, man. You know, we're just moving on. I mean, really, I think the I think the cross, the, the blood is too precious to waste time. If you don't get it, if you can't grasp it, if you, that doesn't move you, you know, and you don't, I mean, you know, that's that's to me where we're at. The people they don't believe in Jesus, they don't believe in the substitutionary atonement, they don't believe in original sin, they don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. When 
They don't have the Spirit of God to lead them to that. They don't have all these things. We're talking to dead people. That's why they're talking methodology instead of instead of about Christ, because that's all they got. Don't you agree? I do completely. And I, I, I couldn't agree with you more with the with the whole idea of not apologizing for it. You know, we just need to, you know, we need to be bold. You know, the, the Bible says that, you know, the wicked flee when nobody chases, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. You know, we need to have that lion like boldness on the streets in our churches, um, in our families, in our culture. And um, you know, because everyone, you know, whether Christian or, you know, whether they're on fire or lukewarm or whatever, everyone sees what's going on around us with the, the culture, um, you know, the culture war, if you will. And everyone wants to see the culture improve, but they want to, um, you know, they want to have morality without the source of our, of our moral lawgiver. And... Um, I think if we're truly going to change our culture and we're truly going to change the, the trajectory of our society, it has to come through regeneration. It has to come through the preaching of the gospel and the Holy Spirit moving men to salvation. And when they have that new regenerate heart, that they have new desires, um, that's what's going to change a country. That's you know what happened in the first great awakening. And there's there's no reason it can't happen today unless people just... You know, unless the, the, the players stay on the bench, you know, that's that's the bottom line. People need to get off the bench and, and get out and affect the culture that they're in for the gospel. And, you know, I know that when I first got into this, I kind of tried to make my thing everyone else's thing, you know, like, hey, I'm preaching, why aren't you? Or I'm doing street witnessing and tracting, you know, you need to do it too. But if we can just equip people to affect those around them, their co-workers and their neighbors and their unsaved family and friends and everything, and just to be an influence for Christ and to boldly speak in those circles, you know, that would have as much impact as, a, you know, preachers out on the street. It, I don't think it needs to be an either-or thing. I think it needs to be both and, and we need to equip people for both situations. And I think the Super Bowl outreach does do that. I mean, I was on a team last year um, 10 men, I think only five of us were really preaching, you know, and the other five were diligently handing out tracts and witnessing. And it is, it really is two different skill sets, you know, um, and we need, we need all of it. We need people who are praying, you know, um, it's, you know, an army isn't just infantry. It isn't just artillery. It isn't just, you know, I mean, we need the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. You know, we need the full body and, and bringing all of their giftedness to the table to make a true effect for Christ in this in this culture. Well, the whole scenario is a low ebb. We're very low ebb and holy living, and I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about prayer life, studying the Word, and being separate from the world, and you know, I don't, we're just a very low ebb, but we're coming up. And so it's, my point in saying that is, it's obvious why we're in the shape we're in. And it's not about, you know, it's just, so we just got to keep doing what we're doing. And the Lord's going to raise it up. I don't have any, I don't, I don't not believe that for one minute. But I do think it's important to understand your circumstances. And so we're the low ebb. Keep preaching. There's lots of motivations to keep after it, and there's none to quit, um, even especially eternally. And the other thing, when you're out there preaching, I mean, I've seen it happen, is that you set so much in motion. I do believe in this sense, and I'm not saying this is a uh, quid pro quo, but prophets precede other things. The preaching come out, and if you use a military analogy, takes the ground, so to speak, and then pastors and people gather behind the prophet. So why, is there, why are you out there by yourself? Well, one reason is, is that's your job, you know, to kind of be the John the Baptist about things, to go out there and take on the spiritual powers and authorities, take on the mockers and take it on. I think that's one job we have as open-air preachers is to just go out there and face it by ourselves or with a buddy, and things will happen behind us that we'll never see. And so... Um, even at the Super Bowl, it's a sports stuff. Once you enter the arena, things start happening. Who knows that by our presence on this corner, you know, how many stories have we heard about 
the window being open and somebody was preaching and nobody was around. Isn't that a Spurgeon story? And then that person gets saved. I mean, all those kind of things happen. That's not a, that's not an isolated incident. And we, we just by our presence in New York city will set so much in motion by the, by your presence in Syracuse or wherever you might be in green Bay. You just set a lot in motion and things we'll never know or never see. And so again, I think, you know, we get the call, we see the message, it's in the Bible, we understand what we're doing. We just don't have to know everything else going on around us to be compelled to keep going. But that's what everybody wants to talk to you about. It's like, why do I have to see? So I did, So it's kind of like, quit apologizing, just get out there and do it. And I think we're all in the same boat on that. So to me, the Super Bowl is a way to reinforce that and encourage guys and keep them going and getting you guys out there and the other way to see all this is that we've got 300 million people in the United States. I read a stat uh, that in the early 1900s, there was one church for every 300 people. So when you get down to thinking about saturating the nation with churches, much less preachers, what would our saturation be? One in 100,000, one in a, you know, 500 of good preachers? We need men out there preaching. I mean, that's a human thing to say. You know, it's God's will about how many actually end up being out there. But, we, you know, we need to be reaching out to people. And so the Super Bowl is one means of reaching out to guys to bring them in there. The Herald Society is another means to reach them out. The Law College is another means of reaching out to guys to get them out and get them out to keep them out. Because we, we could use another 500 guys tomorrow. And can you imagine if we really had 500 or 1,000 open-air preachers that were out there, you know, once or two or three four times a week all across this country, you man, it'd be a – that would, would definitely be a difference. So, again, but the simple part rolls back to us. Be faithful. Get out there and preach. Learn how to do it. You know, take ownership of it, all those kind of words. And uh, there's no telling what the Lord's going to do. Amen. Amen. Um, Bill, once again, if somebody wants to um, look into joining this, um, what's the name of the website again? SuperBowlOutreach.org is the main uh, Super Bowl site. SuperBowlOutreach.org, just like it sounds, or uh, SFOI.org is a sports fan site. Well, they could email you or Lynn, or and y'all could send them that way. Whatever works, they'll find us. Sounds good. I want to thank you for coming on. Yeah, man, and, enjoy it, Tim. Look forward to meeting you when you come yeah. out of the cave. Um, well, my wife lets me out every now and then, but. She lets me out to go make money, and then I, then I she brings me back down here. And... There's a man cave. I just saw that. That's too much. Um, All right. Well, listen, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. I want to thank uh, the other guys, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask John um, to kind of close us with uh, kind of sharing the message, uh, the message that I mean we, we've talked a lot about um, the importance of you know getting people out there preaching. And I just want to close with giving John an opportunity to, to share the gospel message. What the, the message that we go out there to share, uh, what exactly is it? Just I mean, we've talked around it and about it, but uh, John, just close us, and uh, then we'll end the broadcast. What is the, what is the gospel? What is the message as you stand up there and preach on the street? Well, the message is we've all broken the law of God. God is a holy God. He's created everything. Um, he's all powerful and we will give an account to him one day for every time we've sinned against him. When we sin against him by breaking his laws, it's not just a matter of breaking a moral code, but it's actually an assault on the character of God. Every time that we tell a lie, we are saying that God is that, that we cannot trust God to tell the truth. We're misrepresenting Him and saying that He is uh, a liar because we're created in His image. And uh, when we lie, we misrepresent the character of God. And so it's a serious thing. Revelation 21 8 says, All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Uh, when we steal, we, we say, uh, God, I can't trust you to provide for my needs. You're not Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And so I've got to take things into my own hands to provide the things that I want. It doesn't matter what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do. 
when we commit sexual sin, we say, God, your plan of one man and one woman for life and marriage is not enough. I need more than that, and I can't trust you for that. And so every time we sin against God, we're making a direct attack on his character, and hell is exactly what we deserve in regards to our own judgment. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes judgment. And we'll stand before him. The Bible says that we are treasuring up or storing up wrath to be revealed on the day of wrath. Uh, every time we sin against him, we are making deposits into an account that one day we will cash out all at one time on the day of judgment, and we will receive that wrath for all eternity because God is holy and he's just. And um, there is a hell. And so that's the bad news of the gospel that sets up the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for sinners. Uh, he's God in the flesh, and the Bible says that he came, um, was tempted every single way that you and I can be tempted, but he never sinned. And he went to the cross as a sin offering. It says, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So all the sins of all of his people were laid upon Christ 2,000 years ago. God uh, poured out the full brunt of his wrath against his son rather than pouring it out against us. And so uh, in exchange for our sins, we receive the righteousness of Christ. His obedience to the laws of God are credited to us so that when God looks at us on the day of judgment, it's our only hope. He can say not guilty, not because of our obedience, but because of the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so it's the great exchange. We lose our sins to the cross. They're, they're laid upon Christ, and we have his obedience credited to our account. Jesus rose again from the dead. He was raised for our justification. And so our response to all that is that we must repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent. That means to uh, turn from sin, to change our mind about ourselves and change our mind about what we thought about Jesus before and change our mind about our sin and actually turn from it. And in the process of turning away from our sin, we turn to Jesus in faith. And these things are all gifts from God. Uh, he gives us the gift of repentance. He gives us the gift of faith. He gives us the ability to see that we're dead in our trespasses and sins and brings us to life, and we, we turn and trust Christ. And that's our only hope. And so if you're watching this tonight or watching this on YouTube and you say, what, what must I do to be saved? That's the answer. God commands all men everywhere to repent, turn from your sin, turn to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church will not save you. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so you must turn from those things and turn from dead works, uh, those, those false religions that are enslaving you. Uh, the last thing that I would say is that the Bible says that, or Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him take up his cross daily and come follow me. Uh, he's saying that we, we need to die, be willing to die, and that's what saving faith will look like. It'll be so radical in our lives, it'll transform everything to the point that we're, we'll be will, we'd be willing to give everything up to come follow Jesus. So it's not just pray this prayer or raise your hand or walk an aisle, but instead it's a place when God does a work in our lives and we abandon ourselves completely and say, Lord, I'm yours. Um, we s truly see Jesus as Lord and Master and King of our lives. And so if you have not done that, we challenge you tonight before you go to bed, uh, cry out to God. Cry out to Him in your own words. Uh, probably the best sinner's prayer in the Bible is in the New Testament. It says, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When you feel the weight of that, sin and that Christ is your only hope, just cry out to him and ask him to have mercy on you. And um, that's the gospel. And it's powerful and it actually changes people's lives. And so we hope that you will, that you'll do that. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. You.
Very good. And with that said, I'm going to end the broadcast. I want to thank everybody uh, for watching. And um, I will see you next time, uh, next week or the week after when we have our next uh, show. God bless. Thank you.